Hello, everyone. Greetings from Kopangan, Thailand. My name is Thuy, and my pronouns are she, her, they, them. I am the Asian Art Museum's Curatorial Fellow of Contemporary Art, made possible by the Asia Foundation's Margaret Williams Fellowship. I like to acknowledge that the Asian Art Museum sits on Ramatu Shaloni land. Today, it is protected by the Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. We are full of gratitude for the Native American communities that have stewarded this land over the years and continue to do so. Welcome to part two of our celebration of Women's History Month, the Stories and Solidarity Symposium on Displacement and Diaspora with artist Jane Jin Kaizen and cur curator Ashley Yixin Chang. Part one took place on March 6th in person at the University of Western Australia. I'd like to thank our partner, the Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery and the University of Western Australia for co-hosting this event, and especially Lee Kinsella for being a thoughtful and tenacious co-conspirator. This event is part of the Asian Art Museum's Global Art Dialogues Initiative and features artists from our exhibition, After Hope, Videos of Resistance, and also highlights Olga Sarona's Dislocation Exhibition at the Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery. Before we continue, I want to pause a moment to reflect on the recent wave of violence targeting Asian communities in America and around the world. Amid these shifting social landscapes, the museum's commitment to invest in emerging and established Asian artists, elevate marginalized voices, and curate through a lens, global lens of equity, justice, and collaboration is stronger now than ever before. The shooting last Tuesday at three Asian-owned spas in Atlanta, Georgia left eight dead, six of whom were Asian women. Their names were Delena Ashley Yon, Fong Dao Yo, Kim Hyun Jung, married name Grant, Kim Sun Cha, Paul Andre Michel, Park Soon Jung, Tung Xiao Tia, Yu Yong A. -e. Please join me in holding a moment of silence to honor these lives and all the individuals who have been taken from us so abruptly and unjustly. May we learn about and celebrate the lives that they led and hold their families in our thoughts. Thank you everyone. And thank you for joining us in today's conversation. A reminder that we are recording. We're going to unmute everyone at the end so that you can ask our guests your questions. You may also use the Q&A box below as well. I'd like to invite my colleague and co-host Lee Kinsella to share a few words and introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Tui. Hello, my name is Lee Kinsella and I am a curator of art here at the University of Western Australia. I would like to acknowledge that the university stands on Noongar land and I acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owner of these lands and seas. I would also like to acknowledge First Nations people around the globe, wherever you are joining us from. This feels to be a critical moment for change. Thousands and thousands of people have been protesting across Australia calling for an end to sexual abuse and the harassment of women. Triggered by the case of Brittany Higgins, who alleges that she was raped in a minister's offices um, in Australia's Parliament House in 2019, and the Conservative government's inadequate response. In April, of this year, it will be 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody handed down 339 recommendations. Since the Commission, there have been over 450 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deaths in custody. And this has been one of the main issues at the heart of Black Lives Matter, um, the movement as it has occurred in Australia. So there is simmering rage at the entrenched inequalities based on race and gender that are the legacy of our colonial past. And these are issues that are addressed um, within the three exhibitions that are currently showing at the Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery. Today, we focus on Dislocation, a survey of the work of Olga Saronis, presented in partnership with Perth Festival 
Now, this is an exhibition of work by a contemporary artist who is of Greek descent. Born in Czechoslovakia in 1963, she migrated to Sydney in 1971 and is currently based in Western Australia. Saronis's work is drawn from her experience and perspective as a migrant and as a woman. I would like to thank my remarkable colleagues from the Asian Art Museum, Abby Chen and Thuy Tran. Rather than just talking, they have actively supported this international symposium such that the first part has already occurred. And here we are about to embark on the second panel discussion. This is my last appearance, I think, um, before I head behind the scenes and leave you in Tui's capable hands. Um, but before I disappear, I would like to thank all of the creative people, artists and other professionals who have been vital to the realisation of this project, including our next two speakers, Jane Jin Kaisen and Ashley Yixin Chang. It is my great pleasure to introduce Ashley Yixin Chang, a Taiwanese Australian curator. She is an individual who has the capacity to unify and draw people together across continents, borders, institutions and communities. Her generosity and ability to understand the nuances of relationships enables her to connect people through their shared experience and points of commonality, particularly at traumatic or important moments in our lives. What we have in common is a belief in a shared humanity and the power of art and creative output to shape and change society for the better. In 2019, the Australian Bureau of Statistics reported that just under 30% of Australia's resident population were born overseas, which equates to about seven and a half million people. We have a rich and diverse population um, and greater representation of this diversity in the public sphere as reflected in structures of power will bring important and necessary change. To that end, Ashley has worked with artist Olga Saronis for many years. Today, she will be detailing two particular projects that have involved migrant and diaspora groups. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Lee, for your kind introduction. And it's um, a great pleasure to be involved. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge it, the traditional owner and custodians of this land on which we live and work, the Wakja people, and as well as other first Australians connected with this land. Uh, I pay my respects to elder both past, present and emerging. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Yixin Cheng. I'm currently working as an engagement programs curator at Perth Institute of Contemporary Art. I was born in Taipei and grew up in a small town outside of Taipei called Inge which is known as the hometown of ceramics in Taiwan. I relocated to Perth in 2010 and become a mother of the twins the following year. So for the vision impaired, I, some, I, I sometimes wear glasses and um, I'm having a short hair at the moment and I'm in my late forties. <laughs> it's my Great pleasure to be involved in this series of talks and share my journey uh, working with Olga Saranas over the past uh, few years. So um, in Olga's practice, Olga is connected with personal and collective identity and what identity can mean in today's uh, culture globalization. So from a strong migrant feminist foundation, Olga scrutinized the ideas around belonging and place by highlighting some culture and social norms. And her art practice is poetic experience um, and also a very beautiful expression of spiritual and physical space that between bodies and often she invite people to participate and sharing their story. So um, I just want to, you know, take this opportunity to share a little bit how my migrant life and how I got to know Olga. So I'm going to share a little bit PowerPoint here. Um, if I can share my screen with everyone. Here. Can everyone see the PowerPoint now? Yes, cool. good. 
Okay. Um, so I'm talking about, you know, sort of my personal reflection of working with Olga Saranas through my uh, past two projects. So actually the beginning of this journey was actually because coming from Taiwan, working in arts field for over 20 years, I still have the strong passions to, you know, bring my culture close to heart and close to the place where I'm living now. And so through that project, we actually identify a cura curatorial residency exchange uh, program. And that's where I met Lee Kinsella because she was the first um, curator we sent it to Taiwan. And so with this diagram, you probably can you know, see it's a focus on between Turner Galleries and the Guangdu Museum of Fine Art. Um, but with the Perth and Taipei are sister cities. Um, my concept is generally then going to the city's funding support. Um, and then of course the international relationships. So we got the Taipei Economic and Culture Office in Australia and the Australian office in Taipei. Um, with this culture, international culture exchange, I felt this is so important. We have to engage local community. And of course, you know, coming as a migrant, I, my, I have sort of an idea to engage more uh, overseas uh, Taiwanese community here in Perth. Um, so with that project, I felt like it's uh, important to finding a way that actually the non-arts um, people community can involve. So this is where the project begin. So this is the project called A Portrait of Taiwan in Perth, Reflection, Connection, and Collection. So the aim of this project is to foster that culture understanding, respect, and uh, integration. We want to provide a platform to connect, to encourage that face-to-face -face engagement, to build a sense of belonging through culture mapping, and to create a local project that also connected to international audience and our homeland. And as you can see in this um, image, Olga is in the middle. Uh, Olga was invited to be part of this project. And she was really uh, engaging and um, really uh, quickly to identify the women or the, uh, the story that she's interested. So what we sort of, you know, um, a catalyst sort of um, um, a way to encourage these women to be part is actually to bring an object from their home that represent uh, the Taiwanese culture. And of course, object, you know, contains memory, contains history, and, you know, also contains that universal sort of language. And so um, with that project, we actually build around uh, culture tool. So as I said earlier, we want to build that knowledge of culture mapping. So uh, as a migrant, sometimes it's so difficult to connect with people. And I try to create that space that will be involved, uh, you know, culture tour and artist studio visit. Uh, and the first stage of this project is actually the pair artists and the Taiwanese lady, they work together. So the artists actually take a photo of the Taiwanese women uh, they pair with and talk about their object. And so with this process, it's actually quite interesting because the 22 uh, artists that I engage with, um, before I approach them, I actually have to identify the Taiwanese women and understand, try to find out what object they are going to share. So there's a little bit pairing behind the scene that I know, you know, for instance, Candy Lee, she shared a granny fabric. And I know artist Sarah Tuhi, she has a lot of you know, practice in textile. And so I sort of engage her, you know, by knowing they may be interested in this. So there's still uh, a little bit 
things that behind the scene. And then um, very interesting in this process, of course, uh, Olga Serranus choose a lady who's actually was born in uh, Taiwan, but, you know, migrant as a, a teenager to this new place. And then she was really doing very well in her career, you know, working as a um, uh, transportation uh, building business, and she got also travel uh, a lot. But then she, when she become also a mother of the twins, her career or her identity has all changed. But when Olga met um, this Taiwanese lady, she felt so strong and she could see her strength. And so the portrait actually Olga did is very close, very uh, really show her strength. So she done this really uh, strong red and gold color with the thread that uh, kind of symbolize her you know, work as a, this building the um, road to the network. Uh, and it was quite interesting conversation because when Anne saw the image, she was really like very shocked at her because basically her identity or become a mother that actually stripped away all what she knew. Uh, and then when Olga identified that it's like, she can't really recognize. And so that she, she's thinking about, it's a very, um, in, a, in a very feel like it's more of a kind of funeral portrait that we did in Taiwan. And so there was a, like a really interesting conversation. And that conversation uh, with three, was at the beginning with me involved with Olga and to you know talk about these culture differences and then bring in and in. And I think in the end that kind of, you know, we unpack that kind of process and understand each other better. And I think this is the power of an art that actually, you know, really connects people and really go into deep. And I feel with this project, um, I got to know Olga a bit more because that was a as a as a curator, like you need to, you know, deal with this difficult conversation. But Olga was really open and she draw her experience as a mother, as a migrant, and that she can resonate uh, Anne's experience. So that was really powerful for me when I work with Olga on that. And during this time, of course, what I mentioned about, we have like other studio visit. And one thing that really interested um, for me is when we visit Oga studio, a lot of her work is about objects as well. And this one, as you can see, is a, like a feather, uh, you know, she put on my daughter's uh, body and that kind of um, story and the intimate and the context that create in that space has really bring that warmth and knowing that she herself as a mother, it's important to have this dialogue. And I felt like working with Olga is actually also give me that safe space to work with. And the, the final stage of this actually uh, project was actually the older artists, participated artists invited to create an artwork uh, to respond this culture exchange. And so this is some of the um, shots from the exhibition. So as you can see that some of lady, um, they share about tea culture, and this is the um, in the installation work and also participatory work by Luis Monti because of that exchange she felt like the you know the way to share to um, talk about that friendship is by adding all this water into the tea and that slowly dripping into um, the cloth at the work. And this is the artwork that actually uh, Olga has presented in this exhibition. And the title is called Why You Are Here. 
And it's a very interesting conversation, but also very confronting. Of, of course, as a migrant, you often want to know why we are here or why are you here? And I think uh, with this work, there's also you know, a play about this grammatic thing. It's a question or it's a, you know, uh, from uh, that decision why, I, why you are here. And I think what, what really interested for me is Olga's often using this very um, sort of a soft textile, um, but then the words that using like, you know, capital is like loud and shut, shut out to the people, but actually that really sits with you in your mind. And when I finished that project in 2020, when I start to work uh, at Pika, um, Olga has been already invited to present this work called Forest of Voices. And I think in this work, um, she wanted to say it's about listening to others. And also, you know, as a kind of the private intimate conversation that, you know, can all play at the same time through a small suspended um, speakers. Um, and this is kind of like the whispering of desire, love, pain, loose and fear. And actually this work was also inspired by during the you know, COVID lockdown, she realized, yeah, it's so important that we find a way to connect with people. And so during that time, of course, we can't do anything until we came out to the lockdown. And from that, we slowly engage different cultural community group. Um, and I think in the end, Olga probably engage about six, five, uh, five to six different community group, but also she, her personal also collect quite a lot in the past. So she, manage it to edit like a 400 different um, exits into this uh, installation work. And then through that project, we already talked about some of the public program idea. We said it's so important to bring all these participants because we want to give them the space to involve, um, you know, Olga's project because in the installation work, it's suspended, you know, audio um, voices, but who are actually involved in it and what that process will be. And so we kind of um, talk about, it will be really good to identify a few participants who will be really interested in engaging and then be able to feel uh, confident enough to talk and share about their experience through the uh, in the public space. And this is the work that Olga uh, installation work. So you can see it's a, it's a, it's a sound installation uh, with, um, um, with, you know, sort of a very um, uh, intimate uh, dialogue or, you know, voices. And sometimes she, I think she added with a lot of, um, uh, you know, the breeze sound, the ocean. So it's a kind of layers and layers of the sound. Um, and it's also encourage people to stay, to sit uh, in a chair and to listen closely. So it's almost like a very meditative uh, work in that space. And of course, when Olga has this survey in Lawrence Wilson, um, really very, you know, I'm happy to see, you know, people recognize her and that she has brought, you know, all different type of, you know, works that into the show. Um, one of the things that I want to, you know, sort of highlight is uh, in the show, there was uh, this uh, piece about, I just want her to be safe. And for me, this is again, like echoing, you know, why are you here? Um, as a migrant, you know, why are you here? And then when you start having your own family or whatever, you just want, you know, your children to be safe or it can be interpreted um, 
in many different ways. And I think um, comparing, you know, like the, the, you know, the previous work, Olga uh, doing that portrait um, work and then into the, uh, you know, forest of voices, it's like um, the, the two, one is very, you know, uh, sort of very strong about this, um, very emphasized on the color and the character, but then through the, um, the subtle audio work with the forest of voices, it seems like um, that dealing with the strong emotion, but renders it's a bit more uh, non identical and more universal uh, constant background to our daily life. And I think um, what was really interesting for me, you know, as an Asian, you know, Asian curator working with the artists like Olga and her work is so much about, you know, her voice, her voice as an artist and her European background is reflected her willingness to say, you know, what she thinks and, you know, where her, you know, hard on her sleeve and, but this is quite overwhelming in relation to my own voice. It's a kind of um, very different because I do my work sort of, you know, express my own voice is sort of manifested through my work. And cause my sort of cultural background often emphasize this indirect in articulation of voice through a network of others. And, um, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, way that approach or, you know, maybe coming as an Asian, Asian, you know, uh, person and coming to this uh, very Western, you know, um, space, there's uh, lots of, you know, challenges, um, but I often felt like Olga as a migrant, it, she seems so open and willing to talk that gave me a, a, a strong space. And I think like her, a lot of her work, she invite people to share their personal uh, voices. And I think this is the power of art um, that actually, you know, bring people together. And I think um, it's, you know, I feel I'm still on the journey of learning about my new home in Perth. Uh, even this is the 11th year, but um, I think that diverse culture and people and, you know, really opening us the opportunity that we need to be able to give that space and then um, to have a, you know, proper dialogue with each other. And I think sometimes weaving uh, interculture exchange project or cross-cultural dialogue through an art project that will, you know, enable us to do that. And I think um, with Olga's work, she really holds this space very well. And um, I don't know if she will be able to uh, join us this evening, um, but it will be really good if we know she will be able to join some of the conversation. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is sort of my, share my little bit of uh, my experience with Olga and uh, thank you for um, coming join to us tonight, thanks. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, next, um, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker. Um, Jane Jin Kaizen was born in Jeju Island, Korea and lives in Copenhagen, Denmark. Her multidisciplinary artistic practice is informed by extensive research and engagement with diverse communities. Kaizen is known for multi-layered, multi-voice, performative feminist works that bring past and present into relation. Her film installation, Community of Parting, was exhibited at the Korean Pavilion of the 50, 58th Venice Biennale. Kaizen is also Professor of Media Arts at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts. All right, Jane, Hello. it's all you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be in dialogue with all of you. 
Um, I will just try to share um, a PowerPoint to begin with. Uh, let's see. So um, I want to share two projects with you um, that relate to questions of uh, gender, diaspora, um, borders, uh, displacement and belonging. Um, and the first project I will share is, um, is a film called The Woman, the Orphan and the Tiger. It's from 2010 and it was uh, made in collaboration with artist and filmmaker Gustav Sonningkong. This is an installation view from the piece. Um, the Woman, the Orphan and the Tiger is composed of uh, oral testimonies, poetry, public statements and interview fragments. And it, it unfolds in a largely non-chronological and, and layered manner. Um, so it, uh, it joins uh, multiple different times and spaces and experiences. Um, the film traces a genealogy of three generations of women. Um, uh, the first uh, group of women uh, that it deals with is um, the former comfort women who were um, subjected to military sexual slavery uh, by the Japanese military um, between World War I and II. Um, then uh, it uh, traces the history of uh, US militarism in Korea um, and US military prostitution uh, since the 1950s. Um, and then it deals with the history of transnational adoption from Korea to various um, Western countries um, since the Korean War. And so the woman, the orphan and the tiger um, was, um, uh, it, it has many different uh, women narrators uh, speaking in the film. And the main narrators of the film uh, were women in their twenties and thirties that I met um, in Seoul um, around or between 2004 to seven or so. Um, I uh, was born in Korea myself, but adopted to Denmark uh, when I was um, an infant. And in 2001, I returned to Korea for the first time. And so I became involved in what I think about as, as a loosely defined uh, community of transnational adoptees and other women of the Korean diaspora. Um, so what was happening in the early 2000s were that um, uh, more uh, diasporic Koreans and, and transnational adoptees uh, began to return to Korea uh, and also began to um, have dialogues with each other uh, and began to think about what uh, this notion of return means because in popular media, there was a tendency to frame uh, transnational adoptee return as, as a kind of nostalgic um, search for roots or um, uh, biological roots uh, or, or forms of belonging. Um, but what uh, defined this community was also very much uh, looking at some of the structures that um, enable transnational adoption and other forms of migration uh, from uh, South Korea since the Korean War. So um, these are the names of some of the main speakers of the film uh, who were all involved in different forms of social activism around the themes that the film engages and were also um, artists uh, in their own right uh, who have in different ways pioneered in speaking about um, diasporic experiences. Um, I'll show you the beginning two and a half minutes of the film also to show you a little bit about how the filmic narrative is constructed. Something that was important um, in, um, <clears throat> with the woman, the orphan and the tiger was also trying to find uh, an aesthetic language to bring out some of these histories that in many ways have been silenced and therefore uh, are fragmented. So it felt that it was not possible to talk about these issues in a linear chronological manner uh, so that's also one of the reasons why um, a more sort of experimental film language was chosen. Um, the first clip that I will share, uh, you will also hear a chorus of voices accumulating on top of each other and kind of creating this um, cacophony. Um, and you will see an image of uh, 
um, a woman um, uh, who, after giving testimony at a war crimes tribunal, uh, gets up on a speaker's podium and, and then she, she gestures with her hands before she falls. So it's a very sort of um, effective moment uh, that also speaks in some ways, I think, to the limits of representation when it comes to uh, historical trauma. Um, I'm just going to share uh, a quick time. Uh, yeah. Jane, can you turn the volume a little bit? Up or down? Up, because I'm not able to hear it on my end. Uh, are the, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I try again. Maybe I forgot to share the sound. Ah, okay, now I see. I try again. Okay, no worries. Um, tell me if it doesn't work. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how I can talk about something that is unseen that most people don't believe I in. Something really horrible. Been having that very the, the secret dream. itself or the gap of in one's speech gives rise uh, to a ghost. Mom, and yeah, yeah, I personal I illness also is go back to my body. Body. So I started to look at the truth of our heads and ask you they want to think of the adoptee as being the person who is 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 the Person, place, or thing, key, bell, star, the last notes of Andante, a series of high G's against the dark forest of A flat. Listen. These sounds are the things that we cannot talk about, things that we cannot name, but vaguely in metaphors. And although the end is approaching, it seems now that there is no true beginning except the one we mark officially with once upon a time. And in these stories, our own stories, we are always somewhere in the middle. Um, then the, the next project I will share and which I see is rather connected to the woman, the orphan and the tiger is, um, my most recent, like larger project, um, called community of parting. Um, and, um, it was first shown, um, in the Korean pavilion of, of the Venice Biennial in 2019. And it consists of a 72 minute film and a short performative video. And the short performative video that you see on the left side is um, also what's being shown now in the uh, After Hope exhibition. Um, but here I will mainly talk about the, uh, uh, the film and also the background of the project. So um, Community of Parting um, uh, actually takes outset in this, uh, is framed around uh, a Korean shamanic myth of the abandoned Princess Bari 
And it's a story that has been uh, told and retold by female shamans for centuries um, and also been performed uh, as ritual performance. Um, and the myth of Bari is uh, the myth of a seventh daughter who was uh, abandoned at birth um, uh, because she was born a girl. Uh, so basically because of her gender, she was abandoned. Uh, but then um, when she learns that her parents have fallen ill um, and are dying, she decides to go to the underworld to retrieve the elixir of life, which can bring them back. Uh, and as a sign of gratitude, uh, she's offered half the kingdom by her father uh, after they're brought back to life. Um, and the tra transgressive potential of the, this myth in my interpretation and also in other feminist interpretations is that um, she actually refuses this offer to inherit half the kingdom and instead she chooses to become the goddess and mediator at the threshold of the living and the dead. Uh, so I use this um, myth uh, as a kind of um, a uh, narrative vehicle in community of parting to engage questions of, uh, of borders, uh, diaspora, and also um, uh, um, gender discrimination. Um, there were other reasons also for embarking on making community of parting. Uh, one was um, I was part of an international women's delegation in 2015 called Women Cross DMC. Uh, it was 30 women from 16 countries who went to North Korea and crossed the DMC into South Korea. And this was, um, I think, only the third time in the 70 years history of uh, the division of Korea that international civilians were permitted to cross the land border. And this happened on May 24th, the International Women's Day for Peace and Disarmament. Um, and the objective of this walk was to uh, uh, begin a dialogue with women, both in North Korea and in South Korea and amongst um, international peacemakers uh, around um, the involvement of, of women in international peace negotiations. And so this, um, this was a quite, uh, I think both on an artistic and personal level, dramatic uh, trip to um, participate in, and it in many ways also completely shifted my geographic orientation of, of Korea, you know, having before this time only gone to South Korea and really orienting uh, towards that geography. But then um, with this trip, um, I began to think a lot more about questions of borders in terms of geopolitics, but also um, borders on a more fundamental level, um, what, um, you know, how border logics also produce modes of othering and erasure, uh, and how uh, border logics also function on psychological levels. Another um, trajectory into the film and the project was um, Korean shamanism. Since 2011, I've been uh, following um, Korean shamanism in Jeju Island, which is uh, my place of birth. It's, it's an island south of the South Korean peninsula, uh, where shamanism is still very active, also because of um, the historical context of the Jeju massacre, uh, which occurred um, shortly before the outbreak um, of the Korean War. Um, and so this uh, large-scale massacre, um, which was a kind of anti-communist um, uh, retaliation against uh, a local resistance uh, on Jeju Island um, uh, meant that a lot of people died, but it was not possible to talk about um, those who had died. Um, but uh, people could commemorate the dead uh, through shamanic rituals. So in 2011, I met a shaman called uh, Kosunan, and she's also the main figure of community of parting. Uh, her father was also killed during the massacre, and she was um, uh, the lead shaman of my grandparents' hometown in Jeju Island. So the other important uh, uh, trajectory of the film is uh, um, recurring shamanic rituals and chants, um, and it culminates into a ritual uh, for the dead, for, for my deceased grandparents um, towards midways uh, through the film. Um, so it's also a very multi-layered um, piece. Um, I'm thinking that I can show you the first uh, few minutes of the film. 
so you get an impression that that also talks a little bit about um, uh, or you, you hear the myth of of, um, of Bari. Um, the film also, maybe as you say, was was filmed in many different locations um, in North Korea and South Korea, but also amongst um, different uh, diasporas in Kazakhstan, Japan, uh, the US, um, and Europe. Um, so these experiences are also reflected within um, the sentiment of, of Bari. Um, There is a story that has endured division, yet is as old as division itself. It is the shamanic myth of the abandoned Princess Pari, who was exiled at birth for being born a girl. An initial story of gender transgression, a core motive of the myth is resistance and restoration arriving through the figure of the other. What distinguishes the abandoned is a refusal to abide by human borders, to become instead the goddess and mediator at the threshold of the living and the dead. Within sentiments of border keeping, the diminishing of other knowledges and partial remembrance, the abandoned delineates a different approach gathering and mediating what has been torn. It is one of diffusing boundaries between past and present, self and other, here and there. of the abandoned searches between speaker and listener, teller and told. Constantly evolving, no one can claim its root. It is many, since each teller infuses her own life story into the telling of the abandoned. I'm both my parents were originally from North Korea, and they fled after the division, before the war. And my parents, when they first came to the U.S., came to Los Angeles, and my mom was situated in the garment district in downtown L.A., working in the factories there. Вот это вот депортация, 
о том, что наших родителей насильно сюда переселили. Совет Chosun is a regional name of Korea before they separated. Many of my relatives still keep this North Korean nationality in Japan for resistance. Growing up as a teenager in West Berlin meant to live in this island. Some people had family in this Germany, but I did not, or my adoptive family didn't. いつ現年で出てきたんじゃないのでこれ何のご用語ですかこれ結構出てます。もちろんあの、やむえなく自分の人は関係なくあるいはある파리는 아버지의 영토가 닿을 수 없는 장소를 스스로 개척, 포기하고 아버지의 공동체 밖에 매 순간 대풀이 되는 이별의 공동체를 상정하는 데이 지점이 파리와 다른 신화들과 분리되는 다른 여성 신화들과도 분리되는 지점이다. Yes, the film, I mean, it weaves all these complex histories and in a sense, it's also built around the notion of uh, Bari's uh, multiple deaths, you know, so in a sense, uh, Bari first, um, in a sense, she dies when she's abandoned and, and dislocated, um, but then she, um, she, um, she actively, uh, in some ways, confronts um, uh, forces that produce abandonment. And then in the end, she also, she lets go of, of a kind of um, individual self uh, to be able to embrace a, a larger collective self, you know, so there's also this movement um, from uh, experiences of, of displacement into uh, a question of how uh, alternative communities uh, may be formed uh, across um, different times and spaces. Um, so. Uh, I, I think I should stop here uh, and maybe we can move to the conversation. All right, so thank you both so much for that presentation, those presentations, that was amazing. Um, I, my first question um, for you two is around your process uh, for community engagement. Um, and maybe we can start first with Ashley, since we haven't heard from you in a while. Um, and actually, um, one of our audience members had this question for you that I thought was quite relevant. Um, and I'm going to read out loud what she wrote. Um, she said, Ashley, thanks for sharing how objects have the potential to start a conversation, showing us how we are similar more than we are different. From your experience, what we can do to enable the matchmaking experience in our own everyday life with strangers and everyday objects. I thought the person who had the Taiwanese cloth being matched with a person with textile interests was an invitation for connection. Do you have advice on how to create that space today with others or what types of questions invite others into that space? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a really good question and um, yeah, and um, to respond to maybe uh, that you were question about the process, I think that kind of tied up quite well. Um, I think, you know, as a Taiwanese coming to a new place, the first question for me is then, you know, how am I going to process, understand where I'm living? And I think, um, yeah, the culture connection is actually quite relevant for myself. Um, you know, looking at like, for instance, uh, tea culture, like, you know, when I met Olga, I, you know, there was a one lady share about tea and then Olga immediately talked about, yeah, we share Greek tea. And then Iranian has tea culture and Japanese have tea culture. 
So I think, yeah, sometimes you find that connection through that cultural elements and, you know, objects, it's often contain the history and the memory and whatever that could be, you know, like for instance, that uh, special cloth, you know, if you look it into like a different uh, cultures, the fabric, like how they pattern it has all different story. For instance, when I work with the uh, Oga, we engage this uh, Palestinian women group, they have an embroidery and that is all about the storytelling. And so I feel um, sometimes we forget or, or, you know, we just, you know, feel because of the color differences or, you know, language differences become a barrier, but actually through the object or through the, you know, the similarity, it's really easy to connect. And I think, you know, going to that question about the advice of how to create that space today, especially working with others. And I think it's so important. We need to be open at the first, like we need to have that open mind into that engagement. If we don't have an open mind, it's really difficult. And that assumption, you know, sort of limited ourselves. And sometimes, you know, working with others is really interesting. Is it because the artists just give that little prompt and then everything opens up? As, as you know, Olga's project, uh, Forest of Voices, she just talked about, can we share our story of love? And actually love could contain, you know, the loss. And even like looking at um, Jane's project, there's a lot about love in there as well. Even there's a trauma, there's a loss, but it's actually connected. So yeah, I feel, yeah, I'm still learning about this space and you know, how to create that um, space for others. And um, I think it's so important as an arts worker, it's not about individual voices, it's about create a platform, invite everyone to come in, all different types of people, curator, writer, you know, all different disciplinary works. So, yeah, a type of work with a lot of collaboration, you know, government uh, level, international affair, and like, you know, Jen's work, that special experience to go into that journey. Yeah, I think that's really open our mind. I might stop there because I will talk too much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, and Jane, can you talk a little bit about um, your process for a commun engaging community, especially um, the international adoptee women um, in um, the woman, the tiger, and the orphan? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I mean, it really resonated with me also what you were saying, um, Ashley. And I think, I mean, I tend to, they were all friends, you know, like friends and colleagues and, and allies. And, and I tend to, um, the people I work with um, tend to be, it tends to be very organic, you know, really developing from relationships. Um, so I think also it is very relevant also to bring up this notion of, of love and compassion. Um, so, I mean, I think it were each of the individuals that were part of the woman, the orphan and the tiger were also, um, you know, individuals that I really respect very much uh, myself um, and that uh, we, we were doing a lot of collaborations and, and sharing, I mean, knowledge sharing and uh, doing projects and activism together and uh, part participating somehow in each other's um, uh, artworks as well, you know, so, so they continue also to be, you know, people that I consider, um, you know, very close to me. Um, so it was also not um, both with the woman, the orphan and the tiger and community of parting, um, uh, the narration was not really drawn from interviews, but rather from conversations, you know, like um, excerpts from, from conversations. Uh, and um, yeah, I think uh, it really, that was also the impetus for making the work was somehow, it felt like such an important period of time that we were part of. Um, 
in Korea, uh, like a kind of historical moment also for uh, adoptee activism to gain public visibility. Um, so it was very much reflecting um, a desire to to show that sword film work and, and several of the other participants um, in the film, for instance, poet Maya Li Langvel, she was and Jian Zhang Zhuangke, who are both authors. I mean, they were also uh, somehow uh, writing about this collective experience. So kind of like reframing transnational adoption from being a kind of like a very isolated personal experience to actually being um, a large scale collective experience, um, uh, you know, that, that has resonance with, uh, with other individuals. Um, yeah, so it was kind of this ongoing process, you know, of, of, the, of really reflecting and, and learning uh, together. Um, Thank you. And I noticed, um, so in both of your projects, um, the theme of voice comes up pretty often. Ashley, uh, with you, you mentioned that as a curator, so much of your work is more, or it's more emphasized through your work as opposed to centering around you. Um, where, and you said, you know, when you're working with Olga, like, you know, she, her voice is very strong and the work centers around her as an artist. Can you share a little bit about your process with finding your own voice as an Asian woman? Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good question. And it's, uh, you know, a, a really a process that myself still exploring, um, you know, kind of uh, this going back when I first start to work on all this project and people have the question about, you know, my role. And um, so I'm, I'm more of, you know, identify myself as a facilitator, um, but Actually, for me, the facilitator's role that actually could identify the different, um, you know, links with each other. So not just artists itself, it's a, it's the community, it's the, it's the whole society. So for instance, like the, you know, the project, it has like different stakeholder. And, you know, with this international culture exchange, you ultimately, you, what you want to draw is that you, you focus on the local, project like where to deal with the you know current issue but everything is connected internationally and so for me maybe finding that voice is finding that belief like believe what I think what we should do what, should, what how we how the arts as a voice as, as, a, as a way to change and make the change of the society so the individual project, like with all those 22 women, I felt so overwhelmingly because a lot of time they come back to me or I can see they become a friend with their pair artists or even some of them, you know, go on to have their further study in contemporary art. You know, that's the power to, um, you know, to bring people together and to, for us to learn from each other. And I think, for me, that's the that's the voice. That's the that's the actual how do you say um, concrete, you know, evidence of that powerful thing that uh, make people change. So maybe not necessary about my own voice, but it's my belief uh, showing through others. Yeah, I totally hear that. And I think similar um, with Jane, like so much of your work is also about trying to give voice to um, these uh, women, for example, comfort women or people in history or even um, even events in history that have been silenced, like the Jeju massacre, um, comfort women during the Korean War. And so much of your work is about, you know, bringing these things to light. Can you speak on that a little bit? That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think um, maybe I think a lot about, you know, questions of affinity, you know, how can we um, build affinities across differences? Um, because maybe that, I mean, I think that was the sentiment 
with the woman in the oven and the tiger, for example, that these different uh, historical situations, of course, were very different and the ways in which um, uh, these histories have been discussed in public have also been different. Um, but there were shared uh, circumstances, um, you know, that were exterior uh, to these groups, uh, circumstances of colonial legacies of militarism, forms of patriarchy and nationalism, you know, so rather than victimizing individuals, you know, how to, how to look at these structures, um, uh, but at the same time also look at the different forms of um, resistance and resilience that is happening within these groups uh, and how actually building forms of affinities or alliances can also, um, um, you know, be mutually um, generative uh, for different groups. Um, I think this, the, the same maybe counts for a community of parting. Uh, I think a lot of times with, for example, histories of migration, what the individual experience can be is that is it, it can feel like such an isolated experience. But then when it resonates with other experiences that might be uh, different, the circumstances might be different, but, but the, there will be certain resonances, you know, that we can um, connect with, you know, so, so building these affinities across. And I think that was one of the things that maybe really drew me also to, um, you know, try to, to understand or somehow uh, engage more deeply with, with shamanism uh, was um, this ability to reach out and build affinities across, you know, across times across um, geographic distances uh, and, and to provide in a sense a kind of uh, communal space of um, uh, of renegotiation like just even to to let these um, histories resurface you know they might not be resolved uh, but to have them actively with us in the present uh, uh, is also a way of, uh, of of working through some of of, of this historical trauma. Yeah, and I think I think with that, um, Jane, I noticed, you know, in your work, um, you uh, talk a lot about renegotiating borders, um, you know, whether psychological and the, or the geopolitical borders that affect us psychologically as well. Um, and Ashley, with um, your work with the Taiwanese women and Olga, um, I'm curious to know, like, how do you overcome those psychological borders with overcoming differences, for example, and, you know, what kind of conversations you've had around that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting, because when we talk about border earlier, yeah, there's, there's a physical, you know, border, and then there's a, this psychological border. And I think in in Amphitheater, we coming from different culture, we bring our own border. We, we have our own you know, ways of working. And, and of course, you know, coming to the a bit more you know, um, Western world where we, we, we sort of, you know, a, I, in general, like Asia be very, because we come from a big family, you're more aware of your, where your place is, and where your role is, you don't step in. But uh, in the Western culture, it's more about that individualism and then, then you need to keep staying. And so it's more about like building that um, resilience, uh, you know, to deal with that situation. But I also think it's, it's also about time. You need the time to, to let it, you know, develop. Um, there was a, I remember there was an expectation of me, you know, working as an international program manager of Turner Galleries to operating this project. There was the expectation of me to be this very, you know, like a strong character and leading out there. And because of my way of dealing with things, I want to honor the, um, you know, the, cura the curators who are in the exchange program or, under the, you know, the, the working, the government and the different, you know, um, layers of the organization I'm working with. And so it's very interesting to see, because a lot of people come back to me and say, yeah, how did you, how did you bring all these people together? And I think sometimes it's about you not really put yourself the center. 
then all these people will be coming in. And I think the border that we're talking about is actually, yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting because sometimes people have this expectation about the border or, or about the way of working is actually might be, you know, quite different. And I think I wouldn't say it's sort of strategically, but it's more of, yeah, where you try to open that space. If you don't have the perimeter, then you will be able to allow uh, more of collaboration. And that collaboration is actually what gonna be a bit, will be more powerful, will be more important, you know, as we move on, you know, in our, in our time. Uh, this, this, you know, we can't compare the AI, we can't, you know, <laughs> save the country by the individual, but the art is actually make people change and make that concept. And I think that collaboration is then the way to make the border uh, diminishes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, I'm very, I'm very interested in Jen about talking that, you know, psychological border. Uh, I mean, as a artist yourself, um, and then, you know, that you're going back to, you know, finding your roots and finding that history, how you negotiate that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was also so interested about what you were saying about borders, because maybe it's, um, or maybe I can start with, um, no, but I thought you were saying something really important because there's somehow in, I think maybe I was trying to also look at, um, you know, it's, it's not only the physical uh, borders, the, the geographic borders, but also certain borders of, of knowledge, you know, that we can create or certain disciplinary borders, you know, that I think you also speak very poignantly to, you know, like the borders that can exist perhaps between arts and non-arts or between different, um, you know, groups of people. Um, and um, yeah, and, and then the psychic borders as, as well, uh, because, um, I mean, I think one of the things that maybe after this experience of um, participating in this um, women's delegation was that, um, you know, in the end we were able to cross this um, geographic border between North and South Korea, but what to me felt much more difficult was actually to, to somehow uh, dismantle this, um, you know, long-standing, um, a Cold War border, you know, like the psychological border that exists, you know, on both sides, uh, but also very much uh, within the diaspora and, you know, like sort of globally, because um, uh, people have such strong um, feelings and, and ideas attached to borders, you know, that makes um, conversation really difficult to happen. It's, it's sort of like interlocked in, in, in these border mechanisms. Um, so I think that was also why I tried to to look towards this other story, actually the shamanic story of, of Bari, because she's 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 at the thresholds, you know, she doesn't choose size. Like on the one hand, you know, there's this commitment to recalling marginalized memory um within shamanic practice, um oftentimes uh, um but at the same time, there's also this kind of, um, uh, I was very drawn to, to the potential of the myth to both reflect a kind of um, insistence on, on memory, but at the same time also an insistence on um, uh, forms of uh, um, reconciliation perhaps you know like uh, not not in this like large scale geopolitical way but more like an, an acknowledgement like a person to person acknowledgement um uh, you know so i was also trying to 
maybe negotiate that on, on a personal level um, uh, in, in asking for this good or asking for this shamanic ritual, you know, thinking that if, if I'm asking others to, um, to share their stories, basically, um, uh, maybe I have to put myself out there in a sense as well, you know, as, as one mm -hmm. amongst uh, many voices in the piece, um, you know, so, so there's this kind of mirroring of um, subjective history and, and collective history or experience um, that, uh, because I think it's, it's one of the big, um, I mean, I was also thinking about the, the shamanic as a kind of aesthetic practice, uh, you know, that is a kind of vernacular uh, uh, practice, you know, like um, that is very different from a kind of like a Western oriented, a sort of like Western modernist uh, way of thinking about art, you know, which is so based on individuality and authenticity, you know, and that I am the sole creator of artworks. And I think something that, I found very fascinating about uh, the aesthetic practice of, of the shamans that I met is, um, you know, that uh, art always happens in relation, you know, no one is the individual or soul or autonomous creator of something, you know, it's, it's something that happens in this space, um, in this collective space. Uh, so in some ways, I was also trying to, to think about um, you know, if if I bring in this Bari myth, um, how can how can that somehow also be reflected uh, in the way in which the film is made? You know, like from how um, you know I, I approach the uh, the people that are involved in the piece, but also how the the piece is somehow co composed as as a narrative. Thank you so much for that reflection, Jane. I think that was really beautiful that art happens in this collective space. And I also, I also think about, you know, justice happens in a collective space and the work that Ashley is doing with engaging all these different communities. Um, in Australia, like we, we can't just be siloed and stay within our own com communities. You know, we can't, it can't just be the Asian community, the black community, like we all need to work together. And it's so inspiring to see Ashley doing that with these Taiwanese women and Oga and, and the Australian artists. And same for you, Jane, um, in lifting these different voices. Um, I'm going to pause there because we have about 10 minutes left. And I do want to open up questions to our attendees. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone um, and see if there are any questions. Um, Lee's gonna join us for the Q and A. <laughs> I'm back. Well, there is, um, there is one question in the Q&A box for Jane. Um, thank you for the powerful cin cinematography. They showed rather than tell us how the myth of Bari weaves in with the Korean diaspora and gender transgression. Can you share more about the process you undertook as an artist on how you chose the stories to share and the non-linear timeline? Mm. Yeah, I think um, um, maybe with the the stories uh, somehow. I mean, the speakers. There's both. There's a range of speakers. So there's the shaman. Um, there's me. Then there's several poetic voices. Um, you know. So there's. Uh, and it's also to show, you know, in a way where I got uh, a lot of my inspiration from. Uh, so, for example, South Korean poet Kim Hae Sun was a very important um, person for the work. Um, she has um, also written around the myth of Bari um, in in a chapbook she wrote called um, Princess Abandoned, uh, which. And it's, it's kind of a feminist poetics, but where she uses the myth of Bari um, uh, uh, and, and talks about this, this kind of also interrelation, interrelational creative space. Um, 
and then there's various diasporas involved and i think for me it was somehow important to um, not only look at the division of korea from the side of the national geography of korea but but also from these various uh, diasporic migrations um, and also on both sides of the divide you know so um, uh, that was why you know different um, geographies were involved, uh, for example, diasporas in Europe or in, uh, in this former Soviet Union or also in Japan or the US. Um, uh, but also within Korea, because there's also the thing that borders are not only exterior, but also how borders, uh, how border logics, the division of Korea has created all these interior borders. Um, so there's also several women speaking of um, interior border drawings, you know, like because of um, socioeconomics or uh, other factors um, that create borders. Uh, I think with the non-linear timeline, uh, I oftentimes use this kind of uh, montage um, type of filmmaking um, where uh, yeah, different times and spaces are, are put into connection. Uh, and I think it, it very much relates to, um, yeah, to this notion that I was talking about earlier that memory rarely, you know, like it doesn't unfold in a, in a linear way. That's, that's not how our memory works, uh, you know. So trying to find a film language maybe that can, um, you know, speak to that or, or visualize that, uh, you know, that our memory is oftentimes associative um, and is triggered, you know, by, um, you know, flashbacks or um, it, it's, it's also a way of building connections, you know, that um, uh, I think one of the huge things about borders is actually how borders are also drawn in space and time, you know, how certain uh, histories or populations uh, can tend to be relegated to the past, you know, something is of the past uh, and is not relevant in the present, you know, that is, is such a violent way that, that borders uh, tend to function, you know, in space, but also very much in time, you know, what is deemed contemporary and what is deemed, you know, something that is not of, of our moment, you know, so, so that is a way also, I think, that or one of the potentialities of film, you know, that it is able to, to make these connections uh, between past and present and, and also the future active. Thank you. I think that's also something, I mean, with, with, your, with the project you are working on, Ashley, you know, like how objects can, can elicit that similar kind of experience. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, definitely. Well, the object lives longer than us. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, Lee, you wrote something here. Would you like to share it out? Share your reflection with us? Please don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> You've got me now, haven't you? You've got me on screen. <laughs> um, I think it's an extension of this, well, you know, I think it's part of the same conversation. I think, you know, that footage that you use, Jane, of the woman that, you know, just gestures and then moves into a state where she's she collapses. I think it's this kind of, and even the visual form of Bari with a figure that ostensibly has an external contour and yet you see that there's an absence in the middle of the figure. I think um, in the same way as, you know, obviously the shaman is this shape shifter and moving between different states. I think for me who was traveling obviously and not able to speak languages well, um, or would grapple with using language incredibly badly. <laughs> I found that it was that engagement face to face with people or that there were all these other ways to communicate, obviously. And I think that you both utilise these um, remarkably poetic forms that um, can speak across or shift through these various forms very uh, in a really fluid and I mean kind of diffuse way and I think um, you know in doing so obviously create space so I think um, 
in a strange way, we are talking about absence still, and yet um, coming together to talk about it. So it's a, it's a challenging concept on so many levels, but I mean, I'm ending with thank you. And I think it's an incredible thing that we've had you two speaking to this, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And before I close out, um, Ashley or Jane, is there anything else that you wanted to add or share with our guests today? Um, I think, um, I think one thing I would really encourage is um, people to try to reach out to connect, because um, I think this is so important. Um, you know, now with COVID, we have uh, this opportunity to do online, and you know, like we connected to, you know, Thai, you are in Thailand, and Jen is, you know, and in Europe, so, you know, we are very lucky. And I think we should really, you know, have that encourage that more of connection and not necessarily, you know, have a vision, but I think that sharing what we're doing and sharing what we believe that is very vital. And I, you know, thank for this opportunity and thanks for those who can make it tonight to participate. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I very much agree. I mean, I think it's um, it, it's been lovely to to be part of this. Um, thank you for yeah, just facilitating such a, a generous space and, and really also making us feel like we are connected because it's something very difficult to do um, in these kinds of digital spaces. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's been a really great pleasure and um, um, I, I think, yeah, to hold on to this, um, to the importance of, of, of somehow making, making connections and building relations. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Lee. Thank, thank you. you so much for this conversation and helping us to hold space for this. Um, it's really important that, you know, institutions like the Asian Art Museum, um, we've started this global art dialogues to connect artists around the world to have space for this. So please check our website for upcoming events. Um, next week, we're having a conversation um, with artists around the usage of um, fantasy, science fiction, future folklore to build worlds that we want to see. It's called Queer Futures, and it's on March 31st um, at 10 a, 9 a.m. Thailand time, I believe. Um, but please check the website for our future events. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you again to your amazing artists and curator, Ashley and Jane. Oh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Pai, for you, your facilitation. That was great. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Have a good night, everyone.